Oh, hi, everybody. I'm meteorologist Joe Chaffee. On this Thursday night, it's the 31st, the last day of the first month of 2019. January is gone, uh, and the snow drought continues. Although those snow squalls yesterday that hit the uh, uh, areas from uh, New Jersey across uh, to southern New England and Long Island at least uh, brought a few places up to a whole inch for the month. Uh, believe it or not, uh, New York City, for example, uh, at uh, 1.1 inches total snow for the month of January, on top of the 6.3, I think it was, for November, which brings the uh, season total to a whopping 7.4. So uh, definitely a subpar year for the uh, the I-95, the subpar winter so far, uh, for the areas that uh, from Boston to New York City to Philadelphia, that snow hole continues north and west of there the snow has been much closer to average and even above average in some places we're going to take a look at some some uh, interesting lake effect snow that's been going on in upstate new york tonight we're going to look at a, a new storm that's coming in to california this is actually a a, a bit of a powerhouse that's going to be moving uh, inland there and also the uh, the big warm-up because the rubber band was pretty well stretched out uh, when this with with this cold air mass that came down, and now of course the uh, rubber band is going to snap in the other direction, and temperatures are going to warm, not terribly quickly. We're going to do it in steps, but uh, certainly going to start adding about 10 or more degrees a day to the daytime highs. And for my neck of the woods, for those of you who are in eastern PA to southern New England, that probably means we should reach the 50s by the time we get to uh, Monday, or at least near 50. So let's take a look at what's happening tonight. And a big hello to everybody that is on board tonight. Welcome as always. So we still have uh, the wind chill advisories, uh, still have uh, some gusty winds across the Great Lakes and in the uh, Northeast, although uh, those uh, the uh, extent of those wind chill advisories continues to shrink. And you'll notice up in, uh, well up, uh, up uh, in north central New York, north of Syracuse, we still have some winter storm warnings up and some winter weather advisories. And this is from Lake Effect Snow that's been coming off Lake Ontario. It's really interesting when you, when you see on the satellite in a moment. Uh, winter weather advisories are up, up for uh, some areas in northern Illinois and southern Illinois, but not central Illinois. Uh, Indiana, Kentucky, uh, down through uh, the uh, southern half of Ohio, all of West Virginia, uh, Western Maryland, and I'm thinking I, my eyes are not that good. Let me just take a look. Let me just see how far east that goes. Uh, does that include the Washington, D.C., Baltimore area? And it does. Uh, winter weather advisories up for the Washington, D.C., uh, Baltimore area, and also for some counties in southern Pennsylvania. Uh, looks like it goes about halfway across the state, not quite. Uh, into the southeastern portion, uh, there's that we there's warm advection going on, and uh, that is uh, warm air that is moving eastward, and it's moving eastward into a uh, cold the cold air mass, the cold bitter air, ma air mass, and what little moisture there is in there, getting squeezed out of it, and as a result, uh, there is going to be some light snows on the order of uh, maybe. Uh, 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 two or three inches in some places until it gets east of the mountains. And then we're looking at a, a coating to maybe an inch or so. Might get as far north as uh, uh, 195 in New Jersey. I'm thinking uh, 76 in Pennsylvania uh, and 195 in New Jersey. Looks to me like that's where the, uh, the border uh, is going to be with this. Winter storm watches are up now for uh, a good chunk of the state of Montana. And in California, we have a, a, a big storm that's going to be impacting uh, more the southern part of the state than, than the uh, northern part of the Pacific Northwest, but particularly central and southern California, uh, going to get into a, a pretty sizable storm that's off the coast that'll be coming inland over the weekend. And winter storm warnings are already up for uh, the Sierra Nevadas, and we've got some flood watches up, wind high wind warnings, uh, and uh, you know, uh, wind watches, et cetera, et cetera. And I think, by the way, as we go into the longer haul with the pattern that's setting up, uh, we'll probably be seeing some snows up, up along the coast of, uh, of uh, Washington State, 
uh, and Oregon, probably some get snow getting into Seattle and maybe even eventually into Portland uh, in, in, uh, in Oregon. Uh, so uh, the West going to get uh, a, a, a bit of a run here with regards to uh, some winter weather. The uh, uh, WPC Weather Prediction Center in terms of the precip that's expected over the next seven days, uh, I would just advise that what you're seeing in the east is likely to be more uh, toward the latter half of the forecast period than the former and uh, generating some uh, ample amounts of rain across uh, Alabama, Mississippi, down into Louisiana. And eventually, uh, down the road, depending on how the next round of cold air that comes in, how far south that cold air gets, because uh, this takes us uh, to uh, next Thursday night, uh, there you know, may be some action in the longer term uh, down there in terms of some uh, winter precipitation. And meanwhile, out of, along in California, from San Diego all the way up the coast into southern Oregon, you're looking at some pretty hefty rainfall amounts over the next seven days of uh, some, some amounts of three, four, five inches. And you can see there's some heavy precip being indicated in the Sierra Nevada. So there's going to be another round of snow that produces uh, feet, uh, several to many feet of snow in, in some areas. So uh, ca the uh, West has been kind of quiet lately. And, and they, 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 had a, they had a round of weather, then a bit of a break, and now uh, getting ready to get into a, uh, another round of weather. So let's take a look at what's what happening short range, and then we're going to go uh, long range. There's some interesting stuff happening in the longer term that uh, has caught my attention. First off, uh, we'll start with tonight's surface map. The uh, cold high, one high centered in southern Wisconsin. This is as of the 21Z plot, uh, 4 o'clock this afternoon. Another high down in Ohio. Uh, we're seeing double digit uh, and single digit below zero uh, temperatures uh, from, the, uh, from Lake Michigan and on up through northern Illinois and then extending on up uh, in through uh, Minnesota, Wisconsin and up through the Dakotas. There you see some double digit of 4 p.m. Eastern time temperatures. And here in the east, uh, we are we managed to rebound at least uh, where I am in the middle teens after bottoming out this morning uh, at between zero and five above. The temperatures actually came in a bit lower than what, the, what was being modeled last night by a few degrees. In northern New Jersey, in my local forecast area, uh, Sussex County, uh, Sussex uh, re, uh, reported 11 below. Uh, that was the lowest temperature that I could find. I think Scranton got down to about three below. The west wind is is uh, problematic uh, for the cities, the coastal cities, uh, to go below zero because that west wind actually has a little bit of downslope to it. So the bitter cold air tends to warm on, on a west wind. It's when you have a north wind or a north northeast wind where you don't get a whole lot of downslope at all coming down from the Hudson Valley in upstate New York and through eastern Canada that is when we we potentially could see temperatures uh, below zero in cities like New York Philadelphia Washington DC Washington can kind of catch it on both ends depending on the the magnitude of the air air mass and the actual trajectory of the cold air uh, but again the west wind kind of shuts it off and the uh, cold temperatures uh, did manage to bleed down somewhat. Uh, we're talking 50s, though, across the Carolinas and 60s into nor northern Florida, so not too bad there uh, after a cold start this morning. And you're already beginning to see uh, the pieces to the warmer air coming back with 50s and 60s down uh, in coastal Texas and Louisiana. So there's some warm air that's coming back in. And we really can't see too much yet of this storm system that's going to be impacting California, at least on the surface map. The plot doesn't go out far enough. We've got a couple of systems moving into uh, British Columbia, uh, and most of those attracted more to the northeast, but it's a system further to the south that is going to be uh, a player. Take a look at this eastern satellite view across Lake Ontario. This is really uh, fascinating to me to see this, uh, and it happens from time to time when you get the correct uh, wind direction <clears throat> that uh, travels across Lake Ontario almost from one end to the other with, without touching any land. Uh, that is uh, one long extensive plume of heavy snow that is running uh, south, uh, west southwest, uh, I'm sorry, 
it's oriented east northeast west southwest and the wind is blowing right across the lake from one end to the other so it's basically catching all the, the most moisture that you could possibly catch and all of it being transported just inland in upstate new york if you drive up i-81 uh to syracuse if you look at the loop that bright light it's just south of the lake uh, that's syracuse so if you keep going up further north you get to uh uh, places like Pulaski, Watertown, Redfield, that part of north central New York. And that's the area that's getting hammered. It's a very narrow band here on the, the uh, radar loop. And it's been sitting over Watertown for uh, the last day and a half or so. As of 1 o'clock this afternoon, they, they've had about 15 inches. But since then, at least for the last six hours, they've been reporting heavy snow with near zero visibility. So I imagine they got well over two feet. And I'm sure there's some spots in here that are already well past that uh the notice the narrowness of it folks you can drive up there's, there's nothing going on in syracuse which is not that far south of where that snow is taking place it's maybe uh, about a half hour 45 minute drive up and uh, you get into that narrow band and it's just a, a, an absolute uh blizzard going on uh, with temperatures by the way that are down in the single digits uh, along with the wind that they're dealing with. So uh, you know, blizzard conditions go up here uh, with this um, heavy, heavy snow uh, streaming in from off the lake. And again, this is about a six-hour loop here. It, no, nothing's moving. It's just absolutely um, still. I just, I'm sorry. Let me just make sure I got the... Actually, I'm sorry. This is a one-hour loop. So this is just in the last hour. But trust me, if you looked at this this morning, you'd be swear you'd be looking at almost the uh, identical radar. Uh, meanwhile, uh, with the, the addition, these are additional snow amounts because that uh, that uh, that round of lake effect is bound to relax. But still expecting another uh, four inches at Watertown. That's probably underdone. Lowville five, uh, High Market three, and Pulaski nine inches. You can see where Syracuse is, where these highways intersect. Uh, there's nothing. You come further south towards Fulton, you see about two inches and then um, you're done and that's it and the other area that's been getting uh, some fairly hefty snows has been in around in and around buffalo but that area has also that round of lake effect has also relaxed in the off the west coast now you can see the uh, system that is uh, running into british columbia at the top of the screen with the long front trailing to the south but down on the bottom of the satellite on the lower left you can see that twisting that you see that's really the beginnings of this storm system that's going to be coming into California producing uh, the heavy rains and the snows that uh, that you're seeing uh, let me uh, right now just take a moment because I want to uh, give a big welcome to those of you that are watching from my Facebook page meteorologist Joe Chaffee and also from uh, Angry Ben's Angry Weather Facebook page and we've got the uh, New York New Jersey Connecticut um, Stormwatch page, so thanks for being here. And let me send a push out to those of you who are on the free my uh, free weather app, which is now available uh, on all platforms. So I'm just going to get those folks on, uh, and uh, they'll get notified. So hang on one second here. January 31st, 2019, um, live. If you've got the app, you'll get this notification in a second. And here we go. And then we'll get right back to the weather. And by the way, you can download my app by searching, going to Google Play and searching meteorologist Joe Chaffee or uh, heading over to the app store for your uh Apple devices and downloading uh, the uh, the app there and again it is free and uh, I hope you enjoy it okay so uh, we'll uh, get those folks on board now and uh, continue on here's the wide radar view tonight and you'll see that you've got uh, the uh, snow from the sec the system that's coming into Illinois and Indiana and you're also seeing uh, the um, rain that is down off the Texas coast and you've got this uh, weather system that is coming a little weather system coming into Southern California otherwise 
the West is quiet. You can see the relative weakness of the system crossing Illinois and Indiana. It really isn't, isn't much to speak of. So I don't know how much of this stuff is going to wind up holding together uh, or not, but um, we shall see. And this will move along uh, in good order. It will get out of the way in the East by later tomorrow afternoon. Uh, I think the biggest risk will be for areas from southern Pennsylvania down into northernmost Virginia and back into West Virginia and Ohio, pretty much how they line up with the advisories. And I don't really see a whole lot uh, uh, there in order to kind of give, you know, if there was a chance that there could be some upside. Uh, the, 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 the fact that this, is, this moisture is coming into the bitter cold air, if you could squeeze out a, a, a tenth or fifteen hundredths, then somebody could wind up with... Uh, you know, two or three inches out of it. I would think that would be the maximum, but uh, oftentimes in situations like this, you, they get east of the mountains and the, and, uh, the snow just falls apart. I'm going to start with the parallel GFS tonight, which we don't uh, start with usually, but it's all in. And there's that first system. You can see from tomorrow morning when there's some light snows in Ohio and moving into northern West Virginia, southwest PA, Indiana, northern, uh, parts of northern Kentucky, it weakens quite a bit as it goes eastward into Friday afternoon, and then there's very little left of it Friday evening. And in the meantime, uh, we're starting to see that bitter cold air retreating, and it's going to continue to retreat. Warm air is already moving in through the Dakotas and into southwestern Minnesota, so the temperatures are going to be rising fairly quickly from these below zero readings. Uh, the bounce is going to happen pretty quick here, and in some places the bounce is going to be of 60 or 70 degrees in 24 hours. So think about how, how that might feel from being so bitter cold and then going to uh, temperatures uh, well up into the 40s or, or even the 50s in some places. But uh, it often happens that way. And that warm-up is going to gradually move into the east. Now, there are a couple of complications here, minor ones. If, if you notice here by Saturday afternoon, there's actually a cold front that's coming down uh, into northern New England that stretches back over the northern Great Lakes. It's a very weak one. Uh, and then you've got uh, the isobars that are northwest of there. That is the next high that is trying to build down. So that front actually uh, continues to weaken, but it does uh, try to make it down ever, you know, it's weakening out as it moves down into southern New York State. And it's all it's really doing is kind of creating a little hesitation uh, for the warm air to come in but it, it, it will uh, and uh, Sunday uh, you start to see you know there's a little bit of a holdout here in the Northeast but eventually it does get in here for Monday and for Tuesday meanwhile let's you look out in the West Let, let's go to the West region oops wrong one sorry so let's go to the West region here and oh they don't even have tell me they don't have a West region on the parallel I guess they don't all right, so we're going to have to use the wide shot here. And we'll go to the west region on the regular GFS. But uh, you can watch this storm on sat fr Saturday morning. just starts coming in Friday night, Saturday morning. That's a 979 low there that uh, is the print uh, on, uh, on the parallel. And it's a 981 low Saturday afternoon. So that's a pretty wrapped up gale that's coming into uh, the coast near San Francisco. And you can see the extent of the heavy rain and snow there. Look at all that dark, the dark, dark blue. I mean, that, that's that's a very hefty snowfall that is being indicated here. And by the way, um, I okay, I have the precip rate. Let me see if I could switch this to the radar. Um, that'll give us a, a bit of a different view here. So this is what the radar is actually supposed to look like. Uh, and there's that, you see that arm that's out uh, off the Pacific coast. It's kind of a classic um, occlusion that's that's flipping up and around in a, a, a line of very heavy rain and probably thunderstorms in there too as they snake, they, they move their way inland and into the colder air in the mountains, you're getting that heavy snow. There's your low center, just finally crashes in. And over time, by the way, as we move into Sunday night and Monday, colder air is going to be coming down uh, from the north uh, in western Canada because of where the upper trough is positioned. Cold air is going to be bleeding southward through Washington State and into Oregon. So I think there's a chance that, you know, other than that little dying front, uh, that moves away. And uh, then we get into 
a, a, a nice day on Monday, relatively speaking, with temperatures into the 50s. I don't know how much sun we're going to get, uh, but uh, you know there should be. I think there's going to be some cloud cover. There's also a bit of a low here from some energy that comes out of the Gulf uh, and runs up to the northeast. You get a little low that develops off the North Carolina coast, and that's just going to get carried away to the northeast. Now on Tuesday, you'll notice that there's a front approaching early on Tuesday uh, into uh, New York State and into Pennsylvania, and it pushes on through. It's a little faster than what models were suggesting, and I, I'll, I'll, I'll give you my reasoning on why this is, as we move through next week, this is something I think we're going to have to just kind of watch. Right now, Just I got it on the radar screen. I'm, I'm not 100% sure yet if it's going this way, but there are, to me, enough signs that you got to be uh, we, we got to be a little bit careful with the forecast in terms of the duration of the warm temperatures uh, and a high does build in up into southeastern Canada so I think we're going to see some cold, colder readings maybe not overly cold but the bottom part of the atmosphere uh, could wind up seeing some low level cold air coming down even if the top of the atmosphere does not and then you're going to see a series of waves come out so got to uh, watch the low-level cold air here and whether this winds up creating some sort of icing event. Uh, the parallel GFS and also the European, by the way, uh, hinting at this, uh, maybe even more than hinting at it, but here's the first wave that goes by, and there is cold air uh, up into the Dakotas. you got a cold high, so it's going to depend on, on how much cold air you're going to actually be able to bleed down to the eastern states here later next week. But it's a series of waves that will be going through. And, and the parallel GFS actually has three of them and signs even of a fourth one uh, behind it. So it may not have all of the parameters correct, but it, it does seem to want to take a lot of this energy that's coming into the West and start shooting out pieces one after another after another. And uh, the, uh, the cold air issue is something that may, may turn out to be important for uh, for some areas and maybe even down uh, into my neck of the woods. Uh, we uh, haven't uh, seen that happen too often. Some winters it does uh, happen where you get the cold air far enough south. Others, it winds up setting up uh, further north and inland and it's mostly rain events along the coast. And certainly the way things are going, you have to kind of favor this. But I don't want to discount uh, what's happening. Uh, the uh, upper air shows you one of the issues here because we're basically in a in a bit of a ridge position here in the east uh, so it's it's it, it, the, the low levels are different in in, uh, uh, in this especially as you get into February and March you could have the the upper levels get warm and the low levels refuse so just to back the upper air uh, a bit this is of course the the uh, uh, the big upper low that brought down the cold air the polar vortex or whatever you want to call it that pulls away to the northeast and then we go into this this ridge position here there is a weak short wave this represents the cold front you see right here in eastern canada there's a weak short wave going through then on the lower left you can see the storm coming into california that wrapped up upper low that is heading into northern california and then you start to you know the idea of these pieces that get ejected eastward so we're, we're still in this ridge position into early next week. And then on Tuesday, you know, Tuesday, you can see the short wave that's up in eastern Canada. So that's what pushes the front to, through, kind of flattens the ridge out to some extent. And then it's a matter of these pieces coming east, short waves that are going to be ejected northeast. How much low-level cold air are you going to have? I don't know. The upper levels are going to be warm. The low levels may not be. And notice, by the way, the trough position is pretty far west. It's back west of, of, of 95, so 95 west, not Interstate 95, uh, 95 degrees west. So the trough is still in the west. It gradually progresses to the east later in the forecast period, uh, and now we're past February 10th and going on. It actually has a fairly cold look to things as you get toward the end of the forecast period. This time it's got a vort, uh, an upper low that drops down almost on top of us. Now, whether that's reality or not, I don't know. Uh, but um, I, I, I'm, uh, we'll, we'll deal with that in days from now. In the meantime, I'm just kind of worried about uh, this lead setup 
uh, that is happening. Now, uh, one of the things that, that has my interest peaked, let me just widen this out uh, on the upper air. You know, we've been kind of watching the Pacific and the Atlantic and the relative messes that both uh, uh, jet streams are in. The Atlantic's got this ruler screaming jet that runs from off the east coast pretty much straight east out to the Azores and beyond. So there really isn't anything out, anything that gets out there just races away to the east. In the west, you know, you've got some amplitude showing up here with, you know, ridge that builds up towards the Aleutians, a bit of a trough in the Gulf of Alaska. You have energy off the west coast. Uh, and then you've got this upper low uh, in Southern California. And of course, you watch this thing dropping down and cutting off uh, down into um, off the California coast uh, Friday into Saturday and then that moves inland and then again as I said you start to get these pieces but there's not a lot there's really no blocking in the Atlantic side to kind of hold things firm so you're dealing with weather systems kind of moving across one after another after another until we get to again around February 10th 11th you start to see uh, the model wanting to drop a, a, a bit of a vortex here into the east and then that pulls out and another one comes in behind it it does suggest the look suggests at least that after we get through next week with whatever happens uh, it does seem to want to be trending to this colder look whether it holds on to this idea i'm kind of you know for 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 the winter weather lovers you 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 should be at least encouraged that it does you know, it has it starting around day 9 and 10 as opposed to having it out at day 15, 16. Uh, and not all the models agree with this, by the way, but uh, at least the parallel GFS kind of has that in your favor. The uh, regular GFS uh, has, you know, more of the trough where it's been. It does drop something into the east the way the parallel did, and then it goes back to, starts to drop the next trough a bit further to the west. It does have this, this, this flow, though, that sets up from Canada. Uh, one of the things that's got my attention with regards to next week are the teleconnections. Okay? And, and this is why I think we need to be a little bit careful with what winds up uh, evolving in the, in the East. The, um, the, the things that stand out to me are that the NAO is weakly positive, uh, but weakly so, and then actually trends a bit negative, but it may or not necessarily be the right kind of NAO. Uh, so we'll just lay, lay that aside for the moment. The other two, though, the, the Pacific North America index goes to off the wall negative. Anytime I see an indice going off the wall, you know, usually they stay in that range of plus 200 to minus 200 is how they measure the indices. But when they start pushing minus 300 and minus 400, that's when you could get, uh, you know, some some odd things happening. It it it, uh, it, it tells you that that uh, the rubber band is stretched, pressure wise, in the areas of where the Pacific North America Index is measured, which is uh, which includes the East Coast. By the way, uh, it would suggest a big ridge uh, in the east and some ridging, but it probably is being offset by a you know deep troughs out in the west. We saw last year where we had a. a, a with the with the four um, uh, nor'easters in March, uh, we wound up doing it with a very very negative PNA index. Uh, so uh, you know, w w when they're stretched off the wall, you could have some odd setups. But the, the one the other index index that I want to call attention to is the EPO, the East Pacific Oscillation uh, Index, which is the NAO in the East Pacific side. Whenever this goes negative. It usually favors colder weather in the east. And what's interesting is that once we get past February 4th or 5th, you start to see the indices drop down to that minus 200 range. And, and that's, that's strong. It's not off the wall, but it was strong. Yesterday's teleconnections were suggesting that the EPO would get be off the wall negative. So uh, this the EPO being negative could be the reason why the uh, the GFS, the uh, parallel GFS in particular, and the European to some extent, seem to be trying to spread some low-level cold air uh, into the eastern part of the United States. At the same time, the PNA, the Pacific North America Index, is telling you that there's some ridging in the eastern part of the United States. So, so that that is uh, saying that 
your warmer, your higher levels are going to be relatively warm, but the bottom of the atmosphere may not be. So um, this would be more of an ice situation for a lot of spots. So that's 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 I, that's why I think we I, I want to pay um, some uh, attention to this. So uh, the um, uh, there's nothing on here to me that. Uh, suggests uh, snowstorms in the eastern part of the United States, uh, but it does, uh, at least with regards to what's happening in the longer range. I think um, I think there are probably going to be some some interesting things along the way in the next six or seven weeks. Some of them uh, are going to be. Uh, I, I'm I'm, uh, I'm I'm going to go put myself out on a limb and say that there might be a few surprises along the way, and maybe some things will happen that you weren't exactly expecting. Um, if we start stretching some of these indices to some off-the-wall positions, it's telling you the atmosphere is getting out of whack. So it's going to have to relieve that tension somehow. How it relieves it is another matter. But uh, it, there's always in this weather world, as I, you know, I've, I've indicated many times, uh, uh, interesting times ahead, and lots of uh, stuff happens. Uh, you know, you sometimes see things in their sort of evolutionary phase. Uh, in the longer term, and you're not quite sure how it's going to play out, and then the dis models make them disappear, only to have them suddenly re reappear again. Uh, those games are going to be played um, all the time, and uh, it's always more important to kind of get a handle on what the overall pattern is, uh, and then you can anticipate those um, those surprises, or at least when they come, you won't be too um, terribly surprised. Um, Peter Bicker, the Euro weeklies have it getting cold after this warm up and staying cold through March. Well, uh, I I, uh, I wouldn't I I, I how, am I, how do I put this? You know, I, I I guess I guess maybe I just kind of want to get away from focusing too much on those long range monthly prints uh, because. Uh, I, I, because I'd rather kind of get everybody's head in the game of looking at, at, at the shorter range rather than, than looking out. That being said, uh, given everything that's happened in the upper atmosphere, it would not shock me if we wind up staying colder uh, through the rest of February and into the, uh, into the very beginning of March. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, 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 I uh, you know, and, and look, I'd rather stay kind of inside that time frame. I want to get through... Whatever's going to happen uh, next week, we'll get the warm up done, and then let's see how the upper air uh, evolves. Because um, that is uh, that 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 upper air can be very tricky sometimes, and there's there's probably some short waves running around somewhere that are going to throw a few curveballs uh, along along the way. Uh, Chase Masters, hi to you from uh, East Central Ohio. Welcome uh, to my YouTube channel, Lisa Cates. You're warm in Washington State. Uh, but uh, but you may not be. Uh, let's uh, let's look at some of these. Let me bring the map back up. Take a look at these uh, temperatures. Actually, we could pull up the snow maps. Not so much to focus on the amount, but just to kind of show the aerial coverage of uh, of what the snow is going to be like. At least from the way the model prints uh, on it, and and. Uh, at least over the next uh, 10 days, you know, a large portion of the country is going to be seeing some frozen precipitation, including the south. Now, not all of the, not what's in the south that's being shown here is snow. I mean, some of that's ice and, and, uh, and, 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 fr and, and freezing rain and sleet. Uh, you've got uh, the west, though, uh, pretty active. They don't have a west coast shot. Let me just go to the regular GFS. Load, please. It did, okay. Loaded so fast, it surprised me. Uh, but here's your 10-day snowfall on the GFS, and it does include even the coastal areas of uh, Washington and Oregon, although it doesn't show a whole lot of snow. But uh, still, uh, just inland, you're getting some big amounts, and, and you can see the this is all four feet or more in that big blotchy white area that you see uh, in, uh, in, in the Sierra Nevadas there. I'll just back it up so... Uh, is it almost looks like the white background where there's no snow, but that is indeed um, uh, heavy snow. And you've got snow up and down the Rockies into West Texas, 
uh, and even up into parts of North Texas. So uh, how that um, that next frontal boundary sets up, and here's the close-up view of that storm coming inland into California. Okay, so there were, that low just that's that what I showed you on the satellite that twist that's out here. That's the beginnings of that that low center. Uh, that is that is coming out and there you have it crashing inland and up in the Pacific Northwest that cold air comes down from uh, from Canada there Let's see if I can go up further on the west coast is there a shot here that takes me up there a wider view what's the best shot uh, that North Pacific shot no No, that's not going to work. Okay, so that's not good. Um, we don't have a good shot that goes up that far, so I guess the only one really that we could use is this North America shot, and I'll, I'll back it up. You can watch the storm coming inland here. And there's high pressure front up in, in western Canada uh, that's that's forcing some, some Arctic air southward down to the Canadian border. Some of that winds up bleeding down into the northwest, as the low goes uh, to the south of you. So there you go. So you're going to get into some of that. Eventually, as the trough begins to pull a little further east, you're going to wind up seeing the coldest air being uh, further east and then eventually just east of the Rockies uh, over time. Uh, and notice, by the way, that the GFS, the regular GFS, also has this idea of waves coming out, and you'll see them here, but it does it a little differently. It takes you know, it's got this first front on Tuesday. Uh, it goes through, but then it's got this second low, which I think might be a bit too wrapped up that it has up going into northern Indiana and Ohio. I think there's a chance you could see this being flatter and further to the south, and the cold air may be a little bit more important if that EPO measure is correct. And then uh, the front goes by on the operational GFS, and you've got another wave that runs up into the mid-Atlantic states. And th this model wants to show... Uh, snow, ice, and snow and ice across North Texas and back over into West Texas and parts of Oklahoma and Arkansas. That remains to be seen whether that's going to wind up being that way. For the folks in uh, in Southeast Canada, uh, we'll take a look here. And you know, there has been some scattered snows going into this weekend. Uh, the warm up. Uh, gets into about New Brunswick, uh, but and the temperatures do moderate some uh, up through Nova Scotia and Newfoundland, and then you've got this low uh, that uh, exits New Brunswick and moves right over Newfoundland uh, later next week. Uh, the first in the series of waves that are going to be moving through uh, in, into the eastern part of the United States. So that's Tuesday's low and cold front in the east, and this is the one that follows. Uh, most of the tracks are inland. Uh, there's not a whole lot that suggests that we're going to see lows coming up the coast and staying just offshore uh, in, in a pattern like this. With the trough as far west as it is, it, it, it's really a tough sell. Quick look at our friends across the pond in Europe, and we'll start with the current map, which has some snow tonight in southern England and in Ireland as you know, we're talking about this deep low that's that's been uh, pa that's going to pass that's passing south of Ireland and heading inland into uh, France, and it does create a bit of a northerly flow over the North Sea going into Saturday. So there'll probably be some scattered snow showers there. Then we've got the next uh, storm into Ireland with uh, rains for Ireland, England, uh, and snow in the higher higher terrain in Scotland uh, for Sunday, Monday. And then here comes the next one, pretty deep low there in, uh, north of, uh, of Ireland and, and to the west of Scotland by uh, the latter part of next week. Looks like most of the cold air in Europe, at least for now, seems to have been uh, moving more to the east uh, over time. Uh, whether it gets back to uh, the western areas remains to be seen, but at least it, seems, it does seem cold enough for at least some snow here uh, going forward. Uh, let's pull up the uh, snow map. Uh, for Europe, I didn't really have time to do a whole lot of uh, you know upper air analysis here, so I know my view is a bit cursory on both uh, for Canada and for um, for Europe. But uh, still, some ample snows being indicated over the next uh, ten days or so, 
uh, on the continent. Uh, so uh, winter still continues on the European side. Uh, certainly the first, certainly December and January for some areas, not all. Uh, there's been a lot of areas that have done really well this winter. Uh, upstate New York, uh, central and northern New England, uh, back over around the Great Lakes, uh, Chicago, for example. I don't know what their total seasonal snowfall amount is, uh, but uh, I'm, sh I'm, I'm guessing that it, it, it's, it's pretty decent. And in fact, I can, we'll give it a quick check. Let's take a look. If you ever go to the Weather Service's forecast pages, uh, if you click on, you know, there's a climate and past weather link. Right now, by the way, O'Hare, which bottomed this morning at 21 below zero, okay, uh, midway bottomed at 16 below, is now four degrees below zero with light snow falling. I, I, uh, I, I don't remember what year it was, but it was sometime in the mid-2000s. I've never forgotten experiencing where I am in central Long Island, uh, experiencing heavy snow falling with a temperature of six above zero. The flakes were gigantic. I guess there was, uh, you know, there was so much moisture around, relatively speaking, in that really bitter, cold, dry air that you wound up with just these insane um, snowflakes at that temperature. And it was quite beautiful to watch, uh, although it was quite cold. Just looking at their seasonal snowfall in Chicago, uh, the uh, at least through... All right, since December 1st, uh, they've had, had 10.8 inches this month. Uh, since December 1st, 19, uh, 19 inches. And since July 1st, 20.4. So they picked up some in November. This is again at O'Hare. Uh, and it's 11, according to this, it's 11 inches above normal. That seems a little low. Uh, you know, let me, let, let me, let's see if I can pull up one of the other sites here. Um... Let's look at Chicago Executive Airport. And they are... Oh, uh, great. So they don't even measure snow amounts there. So that didn't help. Uh, DuPage, uh, DuPage, we'll try that one. And... Surprise, there's no snow on this... No snow data on this. And I don't see Midway... Oh, all right. I'll try Waukegan Airport. Same here. They don't put the snow amounts on here, except for the what they saw at O'Hare. That's crazy. Um, I'm going to have to do a little research on this, but I can't believe that 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 that, that normal number just seems a little bit low to me. But who am I to say? Uh, okay. Uh, Hey, 99 Wolves, if you're on, how? I mean, you've been going through all of this. I, if, you're, if you're on tonight, I'd love to hear from you and uh, figure out uh, how you've been getting through all this because you've been just, you know, you obviously into that bitter, bitter cold uh, that uh, uh, sitting in that uh, minus 10, minus 15, minus 20 stuff. Uh, I'd love to find out how you're getting through it. Uh, William Uber is now 10 in, 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 the, in the Pines in Miller Place in eastern Long Island. I don't know if the wind's going to drop off enough to go to do some radiational cooling uh, out tonight. Uh, uh, I, I usually keep an eye on West Hampton because if you, it's, a, it's, a, it's a solid radiational cooling night. They're the, usual, they're the first ones to go in terms of watching the temperatures uh, drop off. Uh, Rick, 8013, uh, last year, the 1st of March, we had... 60 degree days and then a four inch snowfall. Those are always fun. <laughs> you know, they really are. Uh, nothing like getting a 60 or 70 degree day. And it does happen. That's happened up here uh, when you get into the, uh, into, into March. Sometimes even in February it's happened. We had it a couple of years ago where Newark, New Jersey had its first 80. To, was it last year that, was it last year that Newark hit 80 in, in, in late February? And then we had, yeah. And then we wound up with the, uh, the, the four Easters of the apocalypse for March. Uh, one good upside, and Lisa Button, you reminded me of this. Uh, there's, you know, there's been insect infestations, uh, be it ticks, but uh, also the uh, in Pennsylvania, uh, there's been stories about the lanternfly, uh, and they're very destructive. Uh, and I don't know how they wound up getting here. I forget, but uh, the hope is that this brutal cold winds up um, uh, killing off. Uh, the the uh, the the I think it's the lantern fly or the lan lantern bug, 
uh, which would be, um, uh, you know, that would be a big plus. Uh, you get these uh, insects that somehow get here uh, on planes and, 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 and boats and everything else, and uh, they get into the population and they wind up doing a lot of destruction to, uh, to agriculture, to trees, and, and so on. So there are there is an upside to uh, all this uh, all this all this bitter cold. Snowy twenty three is two below zero in the Western Catskills. The valleys are about ten degrees warmer. Uh, Scott Briller pointing out, yeah, those squalls yesterday, uh, bringing Central Park's January and December snow total of one, to, to a whopping one point one inches, and only the ninth time since eighteen sixty nine that uh, uh, New York City, as measured in Central Park, had less than two inches in both months, and all nine of those winters would, were below average, which if, if you think about it, that makes total sense because you've lost, you know, December normal snowfall in New York City is between five and six inches, and January's normal snowfall is between nine and ten. So you're talking about, and your total average for the whole season is around 28, 29. I'm talking about the long-term Hundred and you know fifty year average. So if you uh, if you lose your if you lose what is now your snowiest month of the year January and also you lose December, uh, which could go either way. But December, you know, certainly the average is up around five inches. So that's uh, sixteen out of the twenty eight inches are done. So think about the fact that in order to make that up. Uh, you got to do it with a, a snowy, snowier than normal February by a sizable amount and a snowier than normal March. Uh, Jasmine Gravely, thank you for asking. I am doing fine. My neck is fine. I went to the chiro my, uh, my, uh, my friend who's a chiropractor and also one of my, ne my neighbors. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, uh, he took care of me. <laughs> and... Uh, I have apparently some muscle irritation uh, below my shoulder in the traps and they kind of when they get irritated as he explained it to me they can spread up the side of my uh, side of your neck and that's what I went through and it was uh, I had a, I had this before Christmas <clears throat> and it went away and then it came back last week and I couldn't stand it because at times I could feel as if a knot was moving its way up the back of my head it was so un horribly uncomfortable uh, but uh, no matter, uh, he fixed it. So I got to go back Monday for another treatment. And and as long as, you know, as long as it actually helped me, that's uh, that's a really good sign because if the uh, if the treatment didn't help, then it could be that I have like a bulging disc, which means I would have to go get X-rays and then uh, and then deal with that, which is a totally different and how shall we say far, far more far messier scenario. Uh, Richard Melikar, now you know better, my fine and my fine and distinguished friend Richard Melikar. You know better than to mention uh, the sun angle. Okay, <laughs> we don't talk about you know the sun angle is one of those things that gets into the conversation when you know when, when nervous when nervous snow weenies are trying to 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 uh, uh, downplay any snow event that finally winds up happening. Because uh, and then they start pointing to the sun angle or the or the ground temperature or any one of a number of things that um, a lot of times is not really relevant, uh, especially when it snows at night. Okay, we don't see. You know, they start wor worrying about the the moon the, the the moon angle and the street light angle. Okay, it gets a little silly, uh, and it's not something that uh, I uh, incorporate into my forecast unless. Uh, when we get deeper into March and during the daytime, it does become a factor if you don't have any intensity. Uh, but if you have intensity, the sun angle uh, can get wiped out pretty quickly. And if your temperatures are low enough, uh, we've seen it many times where it absolutely does not uh, make uh, make any difference. So, so much on the um, on the sun angle. Michael Dunn from Ireland, hi to, hi to you tonight. Uh, before uh, Jay uh, Buttreesville, uh, as we get into the new ice age, why don't we just deal with the west rest of the winter? Uh, you know, uh, rather than kind of look at this sort of long-term big picture that may or may not be, uh, may or may not happen, may or may not be apocalyptic. Uh, I, I don't. I've never quite gotten this sort of gravitation to the the, the daily apocalypse um, because that's really what what it is. You get these, you know. 
not everything winds up being taken to its natural apocalyptic apocalyptic conclusion okay um, very little is the one horrible the one thing about the, the uh, predicting the apocalypse is if you get it right well, so, then what okay uh, I, I mean think about it if you get the apocalypse right what's what's left there isn't anything left so there's really no point in it all right as far as I'm concerned uh, unless you're wanting to be one of one of the ones that are out there kind of you know being the cheerleader for the apocalypse and frankly that doesn't you're not that, that there's, it's not fun being around people who all they think about uh, is the apocalypse Simon Cowie uh, look on the NASA worldview around the US West and the UK something going on the planet has a bulging elephant in the sky there were some very interesting pictures that were taken from uh, above of uh, of of the uh, upper low uh, the vortex as it's called uh, and by the way this is probably a good opportunity for just me to and you you guys that are on here on a regular basis know this um, there really wasn't anything earth shatteringly special about uh, the upper low that came down from uh, Canada uh, and actually originated from Siberia as a weak upper low until it strengthened once it moved southward into Canada. I mean, there really wasn't anything um, special with regards to this, this or new. This sort of stuff happens all the time. Um, sometimes, you know, that these upper lows, they flex. Uh, sometimes they, 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 they retreat up to the north and stay closer to the Arctic. Uh, other times they uh, move southward and uh, they uh, bring cold air uh, into the United States depending on how the trough looks uh, they're actually by the way if you go to my Facebook page uh, there's a post that I put up it's actually a sponsored post from popular photography and they um, have uh, there's an article that they have about how the Great Lakes look right now with respect to the cold air the cold air mass that moves in some uh, really nice you know dramatic shot there of the great lakes and the effect of the cold air moving over the warm waters of lake michigan and lake huron and lake superior and you also you also can see um uh, erie and ontario in the shot so take a look at that but you do get some interesting and sometimes odd looking um photographs in the midst of all the uh, all the cold air uh, that's around um Yes, pallet probably a good idea to be a good person in case the apocalypse does happen. You want, you know, you got the you get the points on the on on, on the good side of the ledger. Ledger always uh, always a good thing. Uh, G but try. I'm, well, I'm not. You know, I'm not trying to hurt your feelings. I'm just saying. You know, it's the you talk. You know, uh, the, uh, you're not going to know. Look, all the stuff that with regards to. You know the the mini ice age and and is this a new ice age or it's not? You know what? You're not going to know until you look back at it. Okay, which means that probably all of us are going to be long gone off this earth uh, before enough years pass by that they'll look back and say that this this stretch of weather was um, was was extraordinary. Uh, it was because of this or because of that uh, and. In the meantime, uh, we're just kind of, you know, kind of taking the ride along the way. But uh, you're not going to, you know, you're not going to determine anything that's regarding a long-term uh, change in climate uh, over a series of a couple of years. I mean, you have to go decades and decades before, and then you can look back at the data and look back and say, okay, we've gone on average from point A to point B. We've seen the temperature change from this point to that point. We've risen so many degrees. We've fallen so many degrees. So, you know, that's why, forget the apocalypse and just look at what's going on. And if you're a weather buff, uh, you, um, you, 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 you'll just learn to enjoy what you got because you're, you're only on this earth for a, like a speck of time, like literally a nanosecond in terms of the, uh, of, of the total, t you know, time that goes on. And uh, Joe Durso, we haven't um, been tracking weather long enough. You need hundreds and thousands of years of data. And yeah, so if we're, like I said, if 
uh, if, if we're on our way to a, uh, to an apocalypse, you're not going to know it by what's going on now. Okay, and no, it's not being geoengineered. I could already see it. Uh, not being uh, geo or orchestrated by uh, people in, uh, wearing uh, sunglasses and black and black suits and and uh, and uh, you know orchestrating weather changes for some nefarious purpose. Um, let's see. Let's see. All right, good looking. Uh, you know what? I, I I don't want politics on my on my channel. Okay, this is a weather channel. So if you want to make political statements of any kind. Uh, please do that uh, elsewhere. So uh, I am going to put you in a time out. Okay. Oh, there you go. I got rid of the message anyway. All right. Uh, the, Mark G. Perfect. Living and witnessing weather. Exactly. Don't overanalyze it. That's what drive. Exactly. That is such a great point. Don't overanalyze it. That's what drive media ratings like the polar draw vortex drops because of of global warming it's you're absolutely correct that's what it is uh it, it is all uh over not only it's all over analyzed and taken to its armageddon conclusion ignore it okay gas mask chemtrails don't belong here either so you know what uh i'm just gonna i'll give you the opportunity to retract but we don't talk about that sort of stuff um here and you're more worried or enjoy worrying about nuclear war okay <laughs> please do um, all right, so enough of that. Let's get off the, the philosophy, and it's time for me uh, to say goodbye. Uh, the uh, app is free, okay? Uh, the app is free, and you can download it on Google Play, or you can go to the App Store with your iPhone or iPad and, and just search Meteorologist Joe Chaffee. Uh, I can... Uh, let me try and get the uh, link up for you guys. I have it. I should just bring it, have it ready before I, I start the um, start the show. But sometimes I'm busy trying to figure out what exactly I'm going to talk about tonight. That at, at night that I don't often remember to do that. So anyway, so here's the here's the link and. There you go. I'll put it up on the chat board. And it's, again, the app is free. And you don't have to live in eastern Pennsylvania to southern New England to use it because uh, I've added Zoom radar on it and a, a local forecast page so that you just put your location in and you'll get your local National Weather Service forecast uh, for the short range and long range along with current conditions. So, uh Get uh, download the app, and you could also watch the live streams from your mobile device. Uh, if I'm sure many of you are are right now, but you can actually watch from the app. So um, I don't know if Seth Dominus if it's approved in China. I really don't know. Uh, so uh, anyhow, uh, go ahead and download it. And if uh, you really like and enjoy weather. I do have a subscription platform that's just two dollars a month uh, on Patreon, and uh, we do a, a lot of stuff that we uh, you don't see on my websites or on, on Facebook. Uh, the uh, members uh, get uh, live streams just for them. Uh, don't haven't been doing them every day, but when the weather is relevant, and also you can message me anytime, and I'll respond in a timely fashion. And you even get some forecast challenges to do on your own. Last night it was uh, everybody guessing what the low temperatures were going to be uh, in New York City, Scranton, and uh, Chicago. And hey, Scott Briller, if you're on, uh, it was uh, you. You did the best. Uh, you only had a three degree error over all three cities, and you hit uh, Chicago's O'Hare low on the nose at 21 below. So that's on the Patreon platform. Again, it's only two dollars a month, and I think if you're a weather enthusiast. You'll, you'll really like it. And I don't just touch upon the uh, areas that affect uh, me locally, but you know we talk about weather all over the place in the United States, uh, especially in, in some of the bigger storms and what their impacts are going to be uh, uh, across the, uh, as they move across the, uh, the U.S. and headed to the eastern part of the United States. Uh, the, uh, 
You know, I put my snowfall forecasts up there. Uh, you get the weather service snowfall forecast when they're relevant as well. And that, by the way, is also on the app. You can get every snow forecast map to what, for the, what, from the weather service from North Georgia all the way up to Northern Maine, uh, up and down the East Coast. So uh, it, it, it does come in handy. That's free. Patreon is $2 a month. Okay, uh, so uh, do consider it. And for those of you, if you want to do an easy way uh, that uh, really doesn't um, uh, cost you anything, if you shop on Amazon, uh, use my uh, what I call the Joe Stradamus link uh, to Amazon. Uh, you get your stuff. You can search on there, and you know whatever you buy, Amazon throws me back uh, enough coin to pick up a few cigars, and I'm very happy. And it doesn't come out of your own, your own pocket. So it's a very easy way to support what I'm doing uh, on this uh, channel. Okay, uh, tonight, uh, the Joe and Joe Weather Show on Facebook, and that will be at 9.25-ish Eastern Time. So you have to go to my Facebook page, Meteorologist Joe Chaffee. If you don't, if you're not on Facebook, not to worry. Uh, you can uh, watch it. I will upload it to uh, my, my app, uh, and uh, you can watch it there. Uh, or uh, tomorrow morning, it'll be up, up uh, uploaded into the, my uh, YouTube library and you can watch it on a replay. I, I'm not 100% sure what I'm going to do tomorrow because I need to take a little bit of a break. So I'm thinking uh, with the weather calm through most of the country, I might do it tomorrow, but I'm not 100% I'm not sure. If I take the break tomorrow, I will be back on Saturday and also for Sunday. I, I guess it really boils down to whatever I'm seeing on the weather maps tomorrow. If it looks like it's remotely interesting for next week for the east uh, i may just go ahead and do the live stream anyway but uh, just bear that in mind if i don't show up at my regular time tomorrow night don't be too shocked okay so have a great night stay warm stay safe and we will uh, see you tomorrow